a lot of people, especially in the media, have been asking about the record, which is 12, and you know, I'm one step closer. And that, and you know, I feel like if I continue to to play well and stay healthy, that I, I you know, it's something I can do is break the record. And and Wimbledon is always a, a favorite of mine, and I'm looking forward to coming back next year. Sampras joins Rod Laver with four Wimbledon championships and has just Bjorn Borg to beat in the modern era. At the age of 25, the only challenge ahead is the undisputed title of greatest player of all time. Neil Bennett, BBC News, Wimbledon. And Australia are heading for victory in the third test at Old Trafford. The tourists declared on 395 for eight, setting England a target of 469 for victory. In reply, England are struggling. The captain, Mike Atherton, was dismissed for 21 by Jason Gillespie. At close of play, England are 130 for five, still 339 runs behind, with just five wickets in hand. And the main news again, there have been violent attacks by nationalists on police and troops after the Drum Cree Orangemen were allowed to march. That's all from the BBC Newsroom tonight. Good night. One year ago, the world shook with the tragedy of TWA Flight 800. It was just a horrific, horrific scene. But rumors of terrorism soon turned to whispers of a government cover-up. They killed those 230 people by making a mistake. Crash investigators believe they now know the truth, and although the odds are low, they say it could happen again. Whatever occurred in the TWA 800 situation could indeed occur again. But while the airline industry considers its next move, consider this. Thousands of aircraft are potentially at risk. Panorama, tomorrow at 10 on BBC One. Good evening. We've had a fine summer's day over virtually all of the country. Very sunny down over South Wales, for example. A little bit more cloud in the east at times. Brought one or two isolated showers here in eastern England later in the day. And we've seen this rain pushing eastwards across Northern Ireland and Scotland too. As for tonight, it's really the north of Northern Ireland and some of these western parts of Scotland that will keep some rain. may even dry up a touch in the far north. And many southern parts of Britain will be fairly fine. A little bit of low cloud and mist in the west and one or two patches inland on what will be, for many of us, a really warm and quite humid night. Tomorrow morning, the duller, damper weather around the Irish Sea up through western Scotland, giving some drizzle, maybe a few heavier bursts of rain heading northwards up across western Scotland during the afternoon too, but it'll by then be brightening up across the east of Northern Ireland, southern and eastern Scotland. In England and Wales, fine, dry and sunny, just an outside chance of one or two showers, but mostly fine and sunny, which does mean that it's going to be in England and Wales, we'll see the warmest of the weather, just as warm if not a little bit warmer than today, with some cooling sea breezes for the coast. Northern Ireland and Scotland about the same as today. In eastern Scotland, temperatures just a couple of degrees lower. That's how it looks for me for now. Bye-bye. <laughs> oh, man, man. Has Andy gone too far? You breathalyzed this man yet, officer. Tough questions. No loss, he's a copper. Can't have a little drink if he's off duty. Well, as long as he's not driving. New partners. Come on, let's solve this case before he sobers up. That should give us a few weeks, sir. Divided loyalties. You want me to investigate my boss? I wasn't driving. New friends. Oi! Oh, you got style, that bit. Changing times for DL and Pasco, Saturday at five past eight on BBC One. This is BBC One, remembering the television event which captivated the nation and made a sex symbol of Colin Firth. Sparks fly amid the social niceties of the 19th century, as over the next three Sundays we revisit the BBC's award-winning adaptation of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. The dramatisation of Pride and Prejudice is available on this BBC video and audio cassette. Emergency on flight 483. No injuries at all, uh, so they're here somewhere, so we've got to find them. Who's going to talk? What went through your mind at the time? Is, is this thing going to explode? Or pose for a photo. She's pretty, she's blonde, she was on the flight, she might give us a nice graphic account. Excuse me, could you tell us what happened? Whenever anything happens, you stop the press. Seems to be the first priority. Go away. Leave me alone. I mean, that was an experience. <laughs> Getting the story. Airport, Thursday, 8.30 on BBC One.
Freedom of speech is a basic human right. A head of state should be ultimately accountable to the electorate. This is a programme that challenges our preconceptions. I'm not the killer. When I see a target, I see a target. I do not see a human being. Makes you think twice. Parents have a responsibility to discipline their children. Then you decide. You Decide returns with John Humphreys, Tuesday at 5 past 11 on BBC One. People have an opinion. This is one way of getting it aired. Cricket action with highlights of today's play in the third test in 40 minutes. First on BBC One, Joan Bakewell looks at the consequences for church and state if the Prince of Wales remarries in Heart of the Matter. What if Charles were to marry Camilla? Whose business is it but their own? The answer is everybody's. Because Charles will one day be head of the Church of England, his remarriage concerns the church, the monarchy, the constitution of the country. Tonight, Heart of the Matter debates the ripples that will be created if they decide to take the plunge. Whichever way you look at it, Prince Charles has got a problem. The Church of England's strict teaching is that divorced individuals should not remarry. What's more, it says sex outside marriage is wrong, so any devout Anglican who's divorced is expected to live a celibate life thereafter. However, Prince Charles, as future head of the Church of England, is already divorced and has a long-standing relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles. At the time of his impending divorce, Buckingham Palace said that he had no plans to remarry. But should he? Could he? And if he does, does that mean it's time to separate the ancient interdependence of church and state? One senior churchman, the venerable George Austin, Archdeacon of York, believes the church should now assert its independence. And tonight we debate these issues with the veteran royal watcher and correspondent for the Mirror, James Whittaker, Anne Widdicombe, the Conservative MP and Privy Councillor who left the Church of England to become a Roman Catholic. David Streeter, Director of Church Society, an evangelical group within the Church of England. And Roy Greenslade, the Guardian's media commentator and member of the anti-monarchist group Republic. But first, the Archdeacon of York, the Venerable George Austin, makes his case for divorce between the Church and State and marriage for the Prince of Wales. It was, said Archbishop Ramsey, the stuff of which fairy tales are made. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here in the sight of God and in the face of this congregation to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony. Never before were such solemn vows made before God, shared with so many people in so many different countries across the globe. But all too soon, it became a grim fairy tale. As the relationship soured, vows of lifelong faithfulness were forgotten. Both Charles and Diana were to admit adultery. It is announced from Buckingham Palace that with regret, the Prince and Princess of Wales have decided to separate. This decision has been reached amicably and they will both to continue to participate fully in the upbringing of their children. The question now is whether, having married once, Charles can do so again. As a private person, the mistakes of the past could be left behind. But Prince Charles is not a private person and one day will become the supreme governor of the Church of England, a church which teaches that marriage is for life 
and that sexual relationships outside marriage are wrong. It seems simple, but it also seems hard. Charles is nearly 50. He has the appearance of a lonely man in a pressurised position. Yet for the Christian, rules must always be interpreted with compassion. Should we condemn a man to a lonely life? A remarriage may not be an ideal, but it's better than an affair conducted outside marriage. So I believe there are grounds for accepting a second marriage, even though it may not give the kind of moral lead we might have expected from a king. But then, has there ever been an ideal monarch? Our church's supreme governor has, from the beginning, been chosen by accident of birth, not on merit for the job. Monarchs have often not been natural moral leaders, a fact I'm reminded of in York, where I work. We're in the king's manor. The king was Henry VIII, and he took over the abbot's house at the time of the Reformation here. There's nothing new in kings following a dubious moral path. It's been an issue ever since the English church broke with Rome. So did he actually visit here? He didn't visit here until uh, 1541. But who was his wife then? His wife then was Catherine Howard, who was put to death the next year for adultery. She was number four? Five, five. of his wives. Five. Henry may have made a questionable moral example, but he was brutally certain about the loyalty he expected from his new church. Would he understand my loyalty? Well, I think it's best expressed in one of the Reformation Acts of Parliament, which declares that England is an empire quite separate, and all the people of England, be they clergy or laity, owe absolute obedience to their monarch, not to any foreign power which they meant the Pope in Rome. For the church, the break with Rome was cataclysmic and meant a new relationship between crown and church. And today, that relationship is expressed most forcibly in the private oath which bishops take on their appointment when they see the Queen. The content of this oath was until recently shrouded in mystery. Now it's public, and it worries people like Colin Buchanan, Bishop of Woolwich. Diocesan bishops, when they pay homage to Her Majesty, uh, have to take an oath of allegiance to her, and the oath, has, I always thought, was secret. So I asked a question in General Synod of the Secretary General whether he would reveal the words of the oath, because it seemed to me right that anybody who might ever be a bishop ought to know in advance what the oath was. What did he say? He said it wasn't his to reveal. Uh, and so I then asked whether it was true that bishops arrived and didn't know what the oath was till it was put in front of them. And the clerk of the closet, John Wayne, then got up to say, no, that was not true. They were told before they arrived, so they did know them the oath. But they didn't know it when they actually accepted the appointment? No, I don't think it was ever part of the Prime Minister's letter, though I've never seen one of those. But in fact, it's perfectly public. I asked the, the Secretary General at the next Synod to whom I ought to refer, and he said the Home Office. I went and they gave me all the information, including the history of it. And it's a fairly amazing oath. It says that the bishops derive their, all their powers, temporal and spiritual, from Her Majesty alone. Of course, it was drawn up to make sure the Pope hadn't got such power but it sounds slightly odd nowadays. Have you any idea how the bishops themselves feel about taking this oath? Well, I've never been alongside a newly appointed bishop as he opened the bit of paper and found out what he had to say. But I think they actually have to say, well, really, we get our spiritual powers from the church's action, and there's an element of fantasy about this. And, and I think so that's the best way to can cope with it. So it's take an oath before God, but keep your fingers crossed. Well, you put it in pretty blunt terms, but, but the, there must be some element of fantasy, I think, which, of course, royalty encourages in the sense that there's a kind of romantic historical feature to things, which means you don't have to take all of it too seriously. Her Majesty returns the orb, and the Archbishop now places upon the fourth finger of her right hand the ring, the ring wherein is set a sapphire, and on it a ruby cross. This is often called the wedding ring of England. The spiritual headship of the monarch is a key part of the coronation service too. First, the Archbishop of Canterbury leads the bishops in declaring fealty. The bishops of Durham and Bath and Wells, who still support the Queen on either hand, will kneel with the Archbishop, as do all the bishops present, speaking the words of fealty together. I, Geoffrey, Archbishop of Canterbury, will be faithful and true. Bishops pay homage, and the Queen promises to defend the faith. Lady, Queen of this realm, 
true defender of the faith and of your eyes. It's wonderful pageantry, of course, but it all leaves me feeling very uneasy. It worries me greatly that this gives the state so much real power over the church, like the power to appoint the church leaders, the archbishops and bishops. Two names go from a very confidential church commission to the prime minister. 20 years ago, the leaders of the political parties agreed that whoever was prime minister, he or she, and she, of course, a large part of the time, would choose one out of two names sent by the church without any convention or agreement it would necessarily be the first one. There's no way we can know whether it was the first or the second in most cases, is there? Well, there have occasionally been leaks, and sometimes, I think, reasonably trustworthy leaks, and particularly if number two is appointed, the system tends to leak. <laughs> but, but what happened in the cases where it did leak? What, was it a political reason or what? Well, no one knows what reasons were involved. I mean, it might even be that the papers got muddled on the desk at Downing Street, for all I know, but usually one assumes that the Prime Minister had some particular purpose, political or personal, in saying, well, I don't want that one, I'll have this one. There's a good argument for the secular state to recognise a spiritual aspect to its power. But why focus it on one church? Why should only Anglican bishops sit in the House of Lords? Like Chris Bryant of the Christian Socialist Movement, in a multicultural society, I believe this is indefensible. We're now out of sync with the world in which we live, which in Britain is completely plural. There are Methodists, there are um, Baptists, there are all the nonconformist churches, but then there are also people who have no religious faith whatsoever and yet might have a spirituality, and there are Muslims um, and Jews and so on, all of whom I feel should be represented in, in our parliament. Do you think it diminishes the authority of bishops because they sit in the House of Lords? The church needs its own spiritual independence. And I don't think the days of just relying on almost heredity um, for your spiritual authority is good enough. I think everybody's sort of a...